So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Sitting here above 4th Avenue, which is closed today to traffic except for bicycles and walkers and skaters and any non fuel powered vehicles. It's kind of fun to watch. Um, I've been invited here today to talk about the Buddha's path to liberation, and I should start off by saying that I don't consider myself at all to be a Buddhist scholar. Um, I do consider myself to be someone who practices on a regular basis Buddhism, and I teach, I have the privilege of teaching at uh, New York Insight Meditation Center, which is uh, the Theravada Buddhist, Buddhist Center. So. Um, there are several, as you probably know, there are many strains of Buddhism. There's the Theravada train, strain, which is the earliest um, forms of the teaching that were taught by the historical Buddha um, and came down to us through the monastic tradition and through the Pali suttas, Pali being the language of the, the written language of the historical Buddha. And then, as Buddhism evolved and moved into other cultures, the Mahayana Zen traditions and the Vajrayana, the Tibetan traditions, all came much later. Um, and interestingly, you know, of course, when people think of Buddhism now, they're immediately focusing on Dalai Lama, which is the Vajrayana tradition, and of course that's wonderful and, and very important and significant. And those teachings uh, are what bring a lot of people to Buddhism. But the earlier teachings um, are where it all started. And the earlier teachings also um, are uh, what all the current trends in mindfulness are based on. So uh, the other path that I teach I would call it a path, but the other curriculum that I teach is mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a sort of secularized version, uh, which was developed by John Kabat-Zinn back in the late 70s uh, at the Center for Mindfulness at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. So uh, the sort of subtitle for what I was talking about today was uh, Medication or Liberation. Um, Meditation for meditation or meditation for liberation. Not that the two are necessarily mutually exclusive at all. In fact, what's really interesting to me is when people come to take a mindfulness based stress reduction class, usually they're coming for very specific reasons of emotional or physical stress. Uh, and they, in the process of learning these techniques, find this that there's actually much more there in terms of their own personal liberation. The historical Buddha, when he introduced, when he decided after his awakening uh, under the Bodhi tree, he went through a number of weeks figuring out, figuring out what to do next, whether he should just basically be, remain a, a, a mendicant and uh, enjoy his enlightenment. Uh, or whether he should actually start teaching, and he wasn't really convinced that he should be teaching. Uh, and eventually he came to that conclusion. And uh, as you may know, before he came to this place of enlightenment, he actually was, you know, living in a time when there were many mendicants, many people searching. Not too dissimilar from what we're living in now, I would say. Uh, people who had sort of given up their normal lives and were living by themselves in the forest, exploring various forms of meditation, various forms of yoga. Um, and he did all of this. He, was, he went to study with many teachers, um, and his last, the last part of his search, he ended up uh, following an ascetic route, um, basically denying himself food and living on the bare, bare minimum 
almost starved himself to death before he realized maybe this wasn't the way to freedom. <laughs> um, and he left that group and then slowly re nourished himself and uh, decided he was going to figure this out on his own. So after he, after he uh, had his night of awakening, realized you know, what the truths were, uh, and then spent a few weeks uh, settling into this, he then went back to the ascetics that he was, uh, had been with before, and they at first thought he had you know, really gone down the wrong path. But then they looked at him and they realized that something was, had changed. So these were his first students. And the very first teaching uh, that he, and this, of course, is coming down because historically we really don't know what happened, but the way it's passed on is that the very first teaching was what we call the Four Noble Truths, which was, it was published in a Sutta called the Turning of the Wheel of the Dark. So the Four Noble Truths are that the First Noble Truth, or the First Ennobling Truth, um, is that life is inherently unsatisfactory. Life is basically out of balance. Um, and this is just a truth. And as a result, we suffer. And that the reason for this suffering, which is the second noble truth, is due to clinging and craving. Clinging and craving to physical desires, clinging and craving to emotional desires, clinging and craving to material desires, etc. The third noble truth is that there actually is a, an end to this. It's possible that there's an end to this and there is freedom possible. And the fourth noble truth is a path to that end, called the Eightfold. Noble path, noble eightfold path. So this is the first major teaching of the Buddha. The other, one of the other major teachings of the Buddha, which is more of a way to realize the first major teaching of the, the Buddha, is called the Satipatthana Sutta, which is the four establishments of mindfulness. And it's this teaching which helps us realize the four noble truths. Interestingly, at the very end of this teaching, the Satipatthana Sutta, in the fourth foundation of mindfulness, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, the Four Noble Truths come back as part of the teaching. So I like to call this liberation by numbers, because one of the teaching techniques back in pre-literate times, of course, was to create lists that were convenient to remember, because somebody was writing anything down, but of course back then, Memories were considerably better. We, we've gotten out of the habit of memorizing things. The fact before people wrote, that's what they did. And so, in fact, the sutras were written down a few hundred years, a couple hundred years after the Buddha died. But they were memorized by the monastics uh, and repeated constantly. So, in the Satipatthana, we already start with four foundations. So, we have the four foundations. The first foundation, another translation, is the four establishments of mindfulness. So the first is mindfulness of the body, which is probably the one that most people really settle into. Um, now, mindfulness, and then we immediately get into another set of lists. So in mindfulness of the body, this includes mindfulness of of breathing, which is the practice pretty much we just did. So mindfulness of breathing is not about, it's not like yoga breathing where we're breathing a specific way, it's mindfulness of the sensation of the breath. Um, so that's the first foundation, the first, one of the first uh, categories of mindfulness of the body, but then it gets into posture, so we have mindfulness of sitting, standing, and walking. Um, clear comprehension of physical activity. So, for instance, the fact that I'm lifting this glass to my mouth. So it's, it's, it's really being attentive to everything involved in that process. 
the weight of the glass, the feeling of the glass, how my body feels holding the glass, etc. Uh, mindfulness of the unattractive nature of the body, meaning that if we take the body and bring it into its various parts, each part in itself is not necessarily particularly attractive. Um, there is, in, in, in part of that practice, uh, I believe it's 32 elements of the body, that are, 32 parts of the body that are, that are uh, contemplated. So, you know, hair, fingernails, um, bile, saliva, blood, all, you know, individual parts of the body. So that's actually a practice that monastics would have gone through. And it's a, it's a very interesting practice because it, it allows us to separate ourselves, separate the mind from the actual physical body. If we see the body as individual elements, as individual pieces, um, the, attractive, the attractiveness of the body, which is one of the things that we may cling to, you know, we, we are very proud of our body at the times, or not, but... Uh, if you're not part of the body, it's still it's still having contact with that. If you're clinging to something else, that is the the fact that you're not happy with your body. So, in in practicing this con- uh, contemplation on the individual parts of the body, it allows us to actually realize that oh, it's just a bunch of parts thrown together anyway, you know, in a sense. And uh, there are many stories about how that this particular practice is used in the. Uh, easing of the clinging mind. So that's another uh, contemplation of the body. Um, Attention to the five elements, six elements. So uh, again, 2,500 years ago when we didn't have the uh, periodic periodic table of the elements, the elements were broken down into very basic. So we have uh, earth, water, air, fire, space, and consciousness. Um, So that's another form of contemplating the body. Um, There were charnel ground contemplations, contemplations uh, over the different stages of a corpse as it decomposed. So these are all ways of practicing um, the foundation of mindfulness on the body. I need to backtrack a second and actually talk about what mindfulness is. Um, my favorite definition comes from a teacher named Rodney Smith, who uh, teaches in Seattle, and also through a number of very interesting books. It's a very simple definition of mindfulness, which is the difference between fact and thought. So, the fact is that I'm sitting here right now sitting there right now. Those are facts. The thought is everything that arises in my mind in looking at you sitting there. And, you know, all the, the, the uh, imaginations that may be going on and why you're here, who you are, etc. Those are all thoughts, but those aren't facts. Um, the thoughts are, oh, gee, I wonder what I'm looking like right now as I'm sitting here. You know, staring at this camera, staring at looking at you. So those are all thoughts, but they're not facts. The fact is, right now, I'm sitting here, I'm feeling my butt on the chair, I'm feeling my hands on my thighs, I'm hearing my voice. Those are all facts. So mindfulness is really clarifying the difference between fact and thought. So as we work with mindfulness of the body, you know, we would choose one of these Areas and, and most of us now tend to focus in on the sensation of the breath because it's always there, it's very simple. It doesn't generally have a lot of baggage with it, the sensation of the breath. It's always changing. It doesn't require any thought or imagination. It's just there. So mindfulness of the breath for most people, is the simplest place to, to start with these practices. Um, mindfulness of the body as a whole. So in one of the first teachings that happens, for instance, in a mindfulness-based stress reduction class, we do a body scan. A body scan is simply 
bringing attention to the felt sense of the body. So we all, the felt sense being right now, if I ask you to just direct your awareness to your big toe, without doing anything, without moving the big toe, there is a sense that you have of the big toe. Somehow you know that your big toe is there. There's a, a felt sense of the big toe. On the other hand, if I say, what is the felt sense of your little toe, that may be a little more challenging. It's lighter, it's smaller, it doesn't have the same amount of uh, volume, so it's a little more difficult to necessarily attempt. And yet, we know it's there, so what something is there. And so we're attending to that physical sense, a felt sense of the body. So that's another place that people find is very useful to practice. In yoga, of course, uh, if we're really practicing yoga in the true sense of the word, we're, it's essentially a moving body stand, right? So as you find a posture, you notice your mind sort of judging the posture, which is a separate thing altogether, but then you come back to the posture and you notice what's really being felt. So that's another form of the body stand, mindfulness of mind. But what's really important as we go through these practices is just noticing how often the mind is off somewhere else. Right? So the first insight that people have when they come to these practices is they try to direct awareness to one thing, one sensation, sensation of the breath, sensation of a part of the body. And in short order, in no time at all, as soon as they do that, the mind is off somewhere else. <clears throat> and then, there's a judgment that arises, so that's just another thought, another mind thought. We recognize that and we come back to whatever sensation we were originally with, whatever where we had established our mindfulness. So as we were just practicing a few minutes ago, we were bringing attention to the sensation of the breath. And I would occasionally chime in and remind you just to sort of notice where the mind actually is. And the more we work with these practices, of course, the more subtle our attention becomes. And we think that we're attending to the, say, the sensation of the breath. We're actually pretty clear that, oh, that's where, that's really there in the forefront. And yet, well, somewhere in the back there, there's still something hooked. We're still hooked on something. You know? And so we notice that, and then we come back. And it's fascinating as we practice this more and more, and as, we, as our own practice develops, how, how subtle these sensations and subtle the awareness becomes. Um, so what's really happening, harking back to the Four Noble Truths, is that we see that the mind clings. It loves to cling to whatever is out there. So it will cling to some thought, it will cling to some judgment, it will cling to some opinion. Um, uh, and as soon as we notice that, we come back to the sensation itself. We come back to the fact itself. Um, and just notice that difference. And, and we actually can feel the leaning into the thought. We can feel the leaning into the opinion. We can feel the holding on to a view of something. And at that moment, we come back and feel the difference. And so it's really just becoming aware of that flow. Now, the second foundation of mindfulness is referred to as mindfulness of feelings. Now, in this sense, the, the Pali word is actually Vedana. Um, feelings is not emotional feelings, but feelings is really the texture of the experience. So, uh, it's usually taught as pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant or unpleasant. So every time, every mind moment, we're having an experience. And at every moment, and this, there's, this, there's no thought involved. At every moment, the experience is felt as pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant or unpleasant. So I'm sitting here right now. The temperature is nice. The seat is comfortable. It's basically, it's a pleasant evening. Okay. 
occasionally there may be a very loud noise outside. That's a sort of unpleasant feeling. Uh, I should say a very loud sound. In fact, just using the word noise is automatically turning it from fact into thought. Right? Because noise is just an opinion of a sound. So it's interesting how our language often affects what's, what we're really feeling. <coughs> So the second foundation being mindfulness of feelings. Now what we discover is that our, our life, generally, we try to move everything into the pleasant. We, we hold on to the pleasant. We push away the unpleasant. And if something is neither pleasant or unpleasant, we try to sort of move that over into the pleasant side of things. Okay? So again, this is related to this second noble truth. That is... Uh, the cause of our suffering is clinging and craving. So we cling to the pleasant, we crave the pleasant, and we push away the unpleasant. And pushing away is the same thing as clinging and craving. So we crave to get rid of something. So, you know, that's something that we discover very quickly as well. So we're sitting in meditation, in formal practice of meditation. We start with the sensation on the breath. And, you know, suddenly a thought arises. And we find ourselves caught in a thought that is not particularly a pleasant thought, and we want to push that thought away. So we're immediately pushing away one to end. Or, more likely, an unpleasant physical sensation will arise, you know, an itch or a discomfort in the body. And we'll want to shift and move and scratch. And these are you know, natural reactions of the, of the body. But the practice is actually to just notice, oh, that's unpleasant. What happens if I just allow myself to be with that unpleasant sensation for a moment? And we notice as we attend to it that it actually changes and that our reactive mind can ease. And then we can come back to breath. So it's sort of this little chestnut we're teaching just in that little sensation. And so uh, this is where this mindfulness of body and mindfulness of feelings works with each other very closely. So that um, I'm sure as some of you were sitting, in fact I know as some of you were sitting before, you know, uh, sitting on the in this case, the yoga block after time became rather uncomfortable. You know, so our reactive mind got us up to sit down in the chair instead, right? As opposed to just saying, "Oh, this is interesting." You know, here's this unpleasant experience. Let me just sit with this unpleasant experience and see what happens. Let me explore. Let the mind explore the unpleasant experience, because really, you know, keep in mind that in formal practice, we're practicing for the rest of our lives when we're not in formal practice. Um, one, of the, one of the first things that people discover is that uh, as we, that we have formal practices, and yoga is a formal practice, so people go to a yoga class, and they feel great when they're in the yoga class. They go out, they go to their next appointment, they're waiting at the subway, and the subway's late, or the subway's really hot, and they immediately lose whatever peace they have in the yoga class, because they want it to be different. So what we're practicing is actually accepting life as it comes to us, and working from a place of acceptance rather than working from a place of resistance. Just to say we don't want things to change, we don't desire things to change for the better, perhaps, but, but working for that change from a place of acceptance rather than a place of resistance is a very different place to be. Um, so we practice, in formal practice, we notice the unpleasant sensations arising. We notice our reactive mind to that. We notice what happens if we step back from the reaction. Okay? We, we, unpleasant is happening. 
pleasant sensation is arising in the body. And just notice what this unpleasant sensation is, what's really happening. And then you can come back to the body and say, oh, it's interesting. So one, one technique might be, for instance, if you have a pain in the knee, using the comprehension of the elements, for instance. So the pain in the knee isn't just pain. It's, it's an interaction of the four, five, in this case, the, probably the four elements. So there's the interaction of earth, water, air, and fire. So you feel heat. You feel hardness. Even at times, as, as, the, as there's, there's pain, it's, as it's moving, you may feel some kind of coolness or air, which would be the air element. And you might feel the water element, depending on, on what's really being experienced. So you just bring curiosity and investigation to these sensations. And in bringing the curiosity, you've actually you're really going into the fact and not the thought. So the thought arises, oh, this is killing me, this is really hurt, this, I don't like this. All this stuff is happening in the mind. But what's really going on is just sensations. Right? So that's the fact. So we bring mindful attention to the sensation, and we notice what happens. So I think it might be helpful actually right now to just sit for maybe five minutes Bringing attention to the body as a whole, um, I will actually maybe guide a short body scan. Okay, so uh, during the break, the uh, question arose about the breath, <coughs> awareness of breath, and the um, kind of tendency that we have, it's not at all un uh, unusual, that, especially when we're, we don't do this on a regular basis, that A, the desire to control the breath, or the feel of the need to control the breath. Um, and B, that just awareness of the breath can be very difficult without any sort of tools to help that along. Um, and one of the tools, of course, actually is counting of breaths. Uh, that's often a tool that's taught, and it's taught by the Buddha as well. Um, there's also just the labeling, the gentle noting breathing in, breathing out. Um, there are ways of bringing curiosity. Is the breath long? Is it short? Is it shallow? Is it deep? So we can just sort of investigate the breath the same way we investigated, as I said before, the pain in the knee. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and that can be very helpful. Um, but it is about the sensation. It's not about Breathing. So that's the big difference between, say, yoga and sensation. Yeah, it's about that. Yoga practice would be, you know, specifically breathing in short breaths, long breaths, or back of the throat, front of the throat. But but this is really about the sensation. And the breath is always there. And what's really interesting is if, uh, if for instance, you focus the awareness on the next in breath, so that there's this notion of sort of just waiting for the next in breath, just waiting for the next. So you're, you're waiting at the end of the out-breath for the next in-breath as opposed to pushing. And we notice that there is that arising. So uh, one of the, when, when students uh, mention that they feel that they need to control the breath, then I suggest, okay, so control your breath. You take a few very deliberate controlled breaths and then just the body, let the body go back to its natural breath so that you feel that difference and you realize that you can control it. If you need to, you can. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, you know, unless you're dead, the body's going to breathe. Right? So there's no real question. But the question, you know, the mind sort of tricks you into thinking, oh, if, you know, if I don't do this, if I don't breathe, if I don't tell the body to breathe, it's not going to breathe. So, mm -hmm. you know, so take those deliberate breaths, realizing that you always can, and then let the body act as natural. Stay body is being breathed, we aren't breathing, which is true, the body is being breathed. So let's now just do a very short body scan, and as we do this, uh, as I guide you through the body scan, so notice that there are times when things are pleasant and times when things are unpleasant, 
most of the time you may find it being neither nor. Just notice that. Um, <clears throat> and again, we're really talking here about the felt sense of the body. So what's, what's being felt without having to do anything? How do you know the body is here? So just closing the eyes. And just start by directing awareness to the very tips of your fingers. Noticing sensations at the tips of the fingers. You may even notice sensations where the fingernail comes in contact with the rest of the finger. You may even notice sensation between the fingers, the space between the fingers. Notice whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. Without having to do anything about it. You may notice a different sensation on the top of your fingers versus the bottom of the fingers, depending on how your hand is placed. There may be contact. Just noticing that sensation. Noticing sensations top of the hand, sensations of the skin stretched over the bone, maybe even sensing the skeletal structure of the hand. What is the actual feeling here? Without having to come up with words, just noticing what the sensation is. You can often get caught up in words. Bringing curiosity. What is this? Coming to the palms of the hands, not sensation. not just feeling sensation throughout the entire hand, directing all the awareness to this one part of the body, the hands. Perhaps first the left hand, then the right hand. Now letting the hands go all together, directing awareness to the face. So our first sensations are on the lips. Sensations of the teeth and the tongue inside the mouth. Sensations of the nose. So there may be the sensation of the air flowing in and out of the nose. <coughs> Just the sensation of the weight of the nose. Sensations of the eyes. Eyes themselves, the weight of the eyes, the contact of the eye with the eyelid. Is the eye tense or relaxed? It's a 
sensations of the eyebrows. How do you know you have eyebrows? What is that sensation? The sensation is around the forehead and the temples. Pleasant, unpleasant, neither nor. Noticing comments by the mind. Don't like this, like this. Sensations around the ears. Again, sensing the weight of the ears. Sensations in the ears, around the ears. And then awareness of the entire face. It's so noticing what the face feels like, inside out, no expression needed, face as face, lips, eyes, nose, forehead, cheeks, ears. Space that we're in. There's a nice bell outside. It's the time. <laughs> <coughs> so, but what did you notice in that experience as we were doing that? Anything come up for you? Did you notice that you could actually feel something without actually doing something? Yeah, and I noticed that I was aware of things that I normally would not have thought that I could be aware of, like the eyebrows, the front right. of the eyebrows, yes. the, the kind of fingernails without moving. It was yeah. still an awareness. Yeah. There was... What was that? Yeah, we didn't need to move. Right. It's just the body feels. The body feels. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, just use the breath. Um, keep the mind right. focused. So the breath is always there it's to always come back there. to. Yeah. So that we find uh, that when the mind wanders off, maybe if the fingernails and the mind wanders off, we come back to the breath and we come back to the fingernails. So it's, it's just this notion that the awareness can be directed. Yeah. <laughs> because so often we're doing one thing and thinking about something else. So there's, there's that very basic understanding that, oh, actually, the mind can be controlled. Or if you get distracted, then you can use Buddha. <laughs> Sorry. It's Jill. So that's always an interesting experience when the, the cell phone goes off. You know, I know. Because, you know, uh, there's first, of course, the Sorry, immediate. No, it's okay. So the, I always appreciate it, actually. So there's the immediate reaction. Yeah, there's right? the immediate reaction. That you had. Yeah. Then there's the immediate reaction that we had. So right. the first reaction could have been, oh God, somebody left their cell phone on, right? Yeah. Then there's also the thought that I turned my cell phone off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
or I wonder who it was. You know, I mean, all sorts of, you know, so it's just interesting to sort of notice the kind of chain reaction yeah. that occurs, okay? And it's automatic. Right? There was no, we, there, nothing, we didn't have to do anything, it just happened. You know, and how many other times in our moment-to-moment experience are we stuck in that automatic reaction? And this is where the sort of liberation starts to, to come through, because we realize that if we can actually recognize the automatic and recognize when it's important and when it's not, because obviously there are times when the automatic is essential, right? like you know, when we're about to get hit by a truck. Those scenarios. So we need we need our automatic responses, but this being human also creates a situation where the automatic responses become aligned with imagination, and uh, because we're imaginative beings and we have long memories, and you know we get stuck. So that you know one sensation may spark a memory, which then creates a reaction, which has nothing to do with the immediate sensation. So as we start to see that, then things shift. So this is both the kind of uh, the first stage of realization in, in terms of uh, release from stress in the immediate sense. Our stress reactivity is what we're trying to start to see how, and of course there's a whole sorts of now you know scientific background for all of this which was discovered 2,500 years ago, or, or I wouldn't even say discovered 2,500 years ago, but uh, at least clarified 2,500 years ago. Um, that, and now, you know, scientifically, it's very clear what's going on in the brain as we develop mindfulness. Um, that we can actually shift things around. We can change the connections in the brain by practice. So that those reactive moments become responsive moments. And there's just more space incorporated into our moment to moment experience. So the third foundation of mindfulness is mindfulness of the mind, is the mindfulness of thoughts and emotions. And uh, the Buddha put these into uh, eight pairs of, of things to, to comprehend and see through. So we can see the mind with or without lust. We can see the mind with or without aversion. We can see the mind with or without delusion. We can see the contracted mind versus the distracted mind. We can see the exalted mind versus the unexalted mind. We can see the surpassable mind versus the unsurpassable mind, the concentrated mind versus the unconcentrated mind, and the liberated mind versus the unliberated mind. And this really comes now to also the third noble truth, that is uh, that there is an end to suffering. There is an end to, that we can experience the end of suffering. So the third noble truth are those moments where we actually see with clarity that we we can be without thinking of craving. That um, in this case, um, the mind is liberated versus unliberated. So the mind is liberated from craving. That may only happen for a second, first. So uh, as as we practice, you know, these moments of liberation are sort of very brief. And they add up, and then eventually they become longer. Um, so then, you know, when you have somebody who's fully enlightened, there is no craving, there is no craving. Um, as soon as it arises, it's, 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 it's extinguished. Uh, as you probably know, this word uh, nirvana really literally means extinguished. Not in the sense of, I put it out, but the fuel is gone. Okay. 
So the fuel of craving has, has run out. And therefore, the, the flame of, of uh, the flame is gone. The flame is gone. So as we're practicing... It sounds very much like what we were talking about earlier with that fail. Yeah, exactly. How did you define that again? Was uh, freedom from passions. That's what it literally means in Greek. Yeah. Same thing. Not... Yeah, not really. Um, so, you know, we, so we notice the mind when it's without lust. And when it's with lust. And we, and, you know, it's, we also have to be careful when the mind, when we're... And lust, in this case, can be lust for anything. It's not to be sexual lust. Sensual lust. It's a craving that cup of coffee. Craving that. Whatever. Um, yeah. And so we notice, while we're in formal practice, we notice, uh, so this is the mind with lust, this is the mind without lust. Without being judgmental. When a thought arises like this, I crave this. Yeah, so we're, we're really attending to how the thought leads to the craving. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> we can notice with sounds outside, for instance, that, or with the temperature of the room. So we can notice when the mind, when aversion is, is very present. So I don't like that sound. Got to get rid of that sound, whatever. Or when aversion is okay, so it's just sound without aversion. So we just we notice we start to pay, attend to that difference. Um, with or without delusion. Uh, so delusion. Uh, this is a big, big word. Uh, delusion, and it, it's generally referred to, spoken of in terms of delusion of self uh, and delusion of the clinging to self. The clinging to identity. I am this. Uh, I am my profession. I am my So we clean, how do we cling to that, and what's, what's it like when we're not clinging to that delusion? Because we're never one thing. We're not, we're, we're, we, we identify, you know, out of convenience, we identify with, with something. Something. But in actuality, we're just processes. And it's constantly changing. So in the Third Noble Truth, we start to sort of, when we start the Third Foundation of Mindfulness, we're attendant to that. And again, it's, it's noticing when we cling strongly to an identity, the delusion of identity, and when we, what's it like when we're not. Concentrated, unconcentrated. That's, you know, we, we know we can, we can feel when the mind is unconcentrated. It's noticing. So it's just, as we're, we're sitting in formal practice and noticing, ah, okay, my mind is like all over the place. And we just label it. It's the mind all over the place. So our, you know, generally what's really interesting is as people start to work with these practices, it's like, I can only practice when I'm calm, which really defeats the purpose, you know. Or, my mind is always scattered. I have monkey. The common phrase is monkey mind, right? So the mind is just going from one thing to another. Okay, so we just we notice that's monkey mind. We, 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 okay. So that's the feeling of monkey mind. That's that's the experience of monkey mind. What isn't it interesting when that happens? And then noticing when it's not. It's really attending to these, these states of mind and attending to them from the place of realizing that they don't actually hang around for long. That you know, they're they're basically impermanent. They're fed, they can be fed. We can, we can continue to fuel those states of mind, or we don't have to. Um, and 
And then uh, after he lists all these errors, then he says, the sutra says, or mindfulness that there is mind is simply established to the extent necessary for bare knowledge of repeated mindfulness. So we're just, yeah. So we're just aware that the mind is doing stuff, you know, and and we're aware that that we that you know our our habit patterns fuel the mind, and that if you become aware of those habit patterns, those habits of thought, those habits of desire, um, and it could just be some nutrition that we take in from the outside that fuels the mind. Media, for instance, or a particular kind of food. That we, we start to recognize what's really going on. Okay. So, this take who uh, really brought, brought to that practices to this country. <coughs> uh, that's a quote. The experience of oneself relating to other things is actually a momentary discrimination, a fleeting thought. If we generate these fleeting thoughts fast enough, we can create the illusion of continuity and solidity. It is like watching a movie. The individual film frames are played so quickly that they generate the illusion of continual movement. Mm. So we build up an idea, a preconception, that self and other are solid and continuous. And once we have this idea, we manipulate our thoughts to confirm it, and are afraid of any contrary evidence. It is this fear of exposure, this denial of impermanence, that imprisons us. It's only by acknowledging impermanence that there is the chance to die and the space to be reborn, and the possibility of appreciating life as a creative process. So, you know, in looking at this third foundation, we can see that very clearly, that we can become attached to this continual chain of thoughts, thinking that it's, that it's permanent and, and reality, and we can see through that. So that's the delusion. There are, then we have these moments when we can see through that delusion and see what's really happening. See that it's just a continual process. Um, so actually, it might be useful to just um, sit for a moment now and this time really kind of... <clears throat> bringing attention to what's happening in the mind. So bringing attention to thoughts coming and going, bringing attention to uh, when the mind is concentrated, when it's not concentrated, bringing attention to sense desires, just noticing those sense desires when the mind is with sense desires and when it's without. Um, just noticing what we notice the mind doing so just coming back to the breath, coming back to the body, settle the mind again. And we may notice thoughts arising and opinions about those thoughts that could be related to something I've just said. And just noticing that. Noticing that if you feed the thought, feed the opinion with thought, that it continues. Noticing that one thought may lead to another thought. And just in the noticing, observe what
So you recognize that when you get caught up in a thought, you can come back to the body, come back to the breath. Or you simply notice that the thought is there. Noticing that mind is mind. And that these thoughts are just fragments of thoughts coming and going. When you get caught on a thought, it's feeding the thought. But the thought is just thought. We claim it is our thought, but it's just thought. So the delusion would be, it's my thought, I thought it. So through that delusion, the thought just becomes another sensation. Notice when the mind is contracted, or when it's expansive.
grows in the eyes, and the attention back to the space. We've been sitting for a bit, so let's take a few minutes of break. Um, practitioners of prayer would say is more of a personal element, a connection with the, with the uh, with the indwelling Christ that's that's there. So it's um, it's not just words that have it. There's, there's lots of you know, not just a mechanical element to it. There's a personal there's a personal element to it. Both. I mean, it's not a mantra. It's not it's depending on the mantra. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the tradition. It's yeah. not. It's right. Not mechanical. Yeah. It can become mechanical. And that's okay too, but it's I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, because it just sort of, the, the yeah. Jesus Christ is more intentionally devotional, sure, I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But so a lot of the Mahayana monkeys are, are quite devotional, sure, yes. right, right. Um, but the other thing that it does, just as far as what relating to this, is it saying it out loud, just returning to the next time that you say it is sort of like is the same mechanism, the same feeling as returning mm-hmm. to the breath, okay, mm-hmm. oh. This is sort of where I'm, where I'm resting again. Right. And I find myself noting the similarities to the centering prayer practice as well. Oh, yeah, because, sure. I mean, the, the centering prayer was developed as a reaction to a, a lot of this you know, yeah. uh, Eastern meditation techniques. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so, um, in fact, during that last sitting, I found myself caught in a similar feedback loop that I get caught in when I do centering prayer. Of course. I'm noticing a thought, I'm noticing that I'm noticing a thought, and then I'm noticing that I'm noticing that thought, and I just continue for a while. And then it's I, very meta. It is, yeah. And, and so then, you know, and, and sometimes you go back to, in this case, you go back to the breath from the center of prayer, you go back to the prayer word, yeah. and that might help for a second. <laughs> and in the Jesus prayer, you go, you go back to the beginning of the prayer Lord Jesus. Yeah. Prayer. And, and, and some sections with the prayer are nothing more than beginning of the prayer being distracted while saying the prayer, noticing you're distracted, and oh, here's the beginning of the beginning of prayer again, getting back to this, and it's an entire session of the prayer sometimes is nothing more than that. Right. Yep. Exactly. Very small. Okay. Are we ready to unbreak? I can unbreak. The break is over. Oh, you mean we're on? Yeah, I would okay. record it all of that, because that was good. Oh, you did? <laughs> Got it. All right. I didn't even realize I was in camera. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm just curious, any, any more uh, feedback on that practice we just did, in terms of what you noticed arising in the mind? And what did you notice? Did you notice? One thing I, I noticed, um, and I've noticed this before in other practices, Involving self observation is that sometimes there was the sensation, a physical sensation in the head of the place that I was observing from. Mm. And I noticed that. Wow, yeah. You know, yeah. So that, in a sense, uh, that, could, that could fall in that contracted, uncontracted mind. You know? So, so because I, I always felt that the contracted mind was a very visceral, physical. Mm-hmm. Feel I mind. can locate the spot <laughs> in my head physically where I was felt like I was observing from. Right. Right. You always have to have an observation after, you know, the, the before and after. Right, so you're reflecting. So you, you have to reflect and observe, yeah. you know, and compare the experience. That's the investigation. The important thing is right. the experience. What we're really talking about is investigation. Yeah. Of, of experience. experience. And, um, of After course, all, it's all the, about experience. the delusion is like that I'm doing the investigating as opposed to an investigation that simply happened. And so, because then as soon as we have the delusion that I, this I, is doing the investigating, then we're back in the delusion. Yeah, right? It's just the investigation is happening. And that's this whole thing about thought. I read, and I, I have no idea how they did this, but I read that you know something like we have sixty-seven thousand thoughts a day, maybe sixty-seven thousand or more. <laughs> but you know we have a lot of thoughts, right? And 
most of them, we have our favorites, right? They keep coming back and back and back and back. And then we have those that we think are our thoughts. You know, but, but they're not really our. I mean, they came from somewhere else. But, you know, they just... So we, we love to take credit for whatever thoughts are arising. And they're just arising. And they're not your thoughts or my thoughts. They're just thoughts. But the mind loves to take credit for them. And in the taking credit, you're then, you know, as you described, you know, adding another thought to that thought. Oh, that's a good thought. I like that thought. I'm going to come back. i got to remember that thought because, you know, if I do that, this will happen. So this whole other chain starts to happen. And, you know, we're just, what we're really practicing is just noticing these thoughts. There's a wonderful quote that we use a lot by R.D. Lang, a psychologist from the last century. It says, the range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice. And because we fail to notice, there is little we can do to change Mm -hmm. until we notice how failing to notice shapes our thoughts and deeds. So what we're really practicing is noticing how often we fail to notice at first. You know, and then we start to pay more attention and we realize, ah, this is what this is this is this is what the truth in the experience. Um, so it's uh, we can get so especially when we when we start these practices, we can get so hooked on the fact that Oh, I've got it. You know, I see what's happening. Right? And then, as soon as you have that thought, you know, you're, in a sense, back in delusion. You know, because then you want to keep seeing it. It's, you know, and what we're really working with is just, oh, okay. This, it's happening. The process is going. I'm, you know, with, with this, this body-mind mechanism is along for the ride. The process is happening. I can, I can, of course, you know, for practical reasons, I can really identify with it when I need to. You know, I can, and then, and then there are the times when I'm realizing that identifying too strongly creates other problems. So I recognize, okay, now I, 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 I spaciousness is there. You know, just a lot of spaciousness. To be. So this fourth foundation of mindfulness is, is referred to as mindfulness of mind objects. It's often called mindfulness of the dharmas. So this word dharma uh, has many different uses. Dharma is is the teachings, it's the way, the path. It's also translated as phenomena. Um, In the context of this particular sutta and this particular teaching, um, what the Buddha did was sort of categorize experience um, in this fourth foundation. Uh, so this is another list of lists, which I'll just go over. We, we won't talk about all of them because it's, uh, you know, we'll be here a long time. Uh, so the first uh, phenomena are what we refer to as the five hindrances. So these are very common. I mean, you've all experienced them already. So the hindrances are in a way it relate back to what we, the third foundation. The hindrances are uh, sense desires, aversion, sleepiness, um, ill will, no, that's aversion, uh, sorry, the agitated mind, um, gosh, I left one out here, what am I missing? Uh, sense desires, aversion, sleepiness, agitated mind, and um, eats. Hold on. Hold the tape. I think he mentioned it early on. Uh, Did you make me say? Aversion, agitated mind. Oh, and uh, um, craving? Well, that's sense desires. Sense desires, aversion, sleepiness, and agitated mind. This is embarrassing and I don't know. Um, but it'll come to me, but we'll come back to that. It's okay. So what we're doing with, with the hindrances... Doubt uh, or uncertainty. What? Doubt. Doubt. Thank you. Doubt. That's a big one. That's the, actually some... And it's, it's, it's so curious that I forgot about doubt, because some people refer to doubt as the mother of all hindrances. 
you know, you're just sort of doubting the whole time. Yeah. So if you're doubting the whole time, thank you very much, uh, that uh, we really get, you know, we get stuck. So in, in practice, what's happening is that, so we're sitting in, in formal practice, um, and we notice that we're dealing with uh, the agitated mind. So we notice the hindrance. So this is the notice, you know, we're, we're, we notice when we fail to notice that, that we're just stuck in it. You know, we're stuck in the agitation. But as soon as we notice that we're in the agitated mind, then we can do something about it. We, you know, we can re-energize, we can check our posture, we can, you know, really come back to the breath with, with more energy. Same thing with sleepiness, which is probably the most common thing for people starting with practices. So yeah. you notice that. Oh, the sleepy mind, you know, the foggy mind, the kind of boredom. muddy mind, the, the boredom. Um, you know, so we bring curiosity to that, actually. We investigate it. Oh, that's interesting. So what is the mind like just before I feel that, you know, those, you know just before that happens? What's going on in the mind? What's really? So in bringing the curiosity to what, what's happening, Suddenly, we're not necessarily sleeping because we've, we've taken an interest in the process. Um, and uh, each of these hindrances has a, obviously has an antidote. So sleeping is the other antidote. So just taking a few very deliberate deep breaths, energizing the body, yeah. checking your posture, pulling on the earlobes. Some people say doing this is helpful. I mean, so there are many standing up, practicing with your eyes open. Those are sort of obvious antidotes to the but in the context of the foundations of mindfulness, it's also just the recognizing of the interest, the recognizing of what's going on. And it seems really obvious, right? Oh, obviously I'm sleeping. But then when you bring some investigative investigation to it, you realize that there's actually more to it. There's more to it than that. Um, Sense desires, so you know the the antidotes to sense desires. Um, again, it's recognizing that, that it's there. Uh, you could, in a, in some sense, especially with uh, having to do with sexual desire, um, one of the antidotes is to, to bring back that part of the foundations of the body where you start to examine the actual individual parts of the body and. Then, Suddenly, you know, this kind of, the sexual desire may ease because you're you're examining file or whatever. You know, so there's no need for sexual desire. You know, it just it fizzles. Um, again, you can also just come back right back to the sensation of the breath. As a way of doing that. Um, we don't have time to really work with all of these, so I just want to go. So, in terms of the phenomena and the Dharma. Uh, Mindfulness of the dharmas, so the five hindrances, the five aggregates are something else we start to, to notice, and these are all very closely related. So the five aggregates are forms, feelings, perceptions, mental habitations, and consciousness. So the five aggregates are essentially what create our delusion of self. It's clinging to the aggregates, they're called the aggregates of clinging. So we cling to our form, we cling to our thoughts, we cling to our uh, perceptions. Um, and you know, this is what creates the delusion of self. And we, you know, when we start to really attend to that and see how, we, how in clinging to the body, in clinging to our identification of thoughts, um, in clinging to our perceptions, for instance, our views, you know, we are really constricting around this fixed idea of self, as opposed to simply observing that, oh, it's just this flow of the aggregates that momentarily creates the delusion of self. It's always changing anyway. So we, we start to recognize the impermanence of that, and experience that impermanence on a momentary basis. And then, again, we then notice that moment of liberation. Five aggregates, the six sense spaces, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, and mouth. So you know, we're just saying, yeah, so it's, you know, uh, again, these are, um, 
this, this again relates to clinging and craving because what's really happening is that one of our sense the sense bases are constantly looking for something to cling to and crave to. It's like having these tentacles, uh, and so we, we sort of we can feel that we can feel what it's like when those sense bases. So in meditation, in you know, formal meditation, we're closing the eyes, so we're shutting off one sense base. We're sitting still, so we're shutting off perhaps the sense base of touch. Um, we're uh, and when one goes on retreat, you know, one very much stops. You know, we, we, we don't talk, so you set off another. The other retreatants have you know, kept us from that uh, sound, at least part of the sense base of sound, etc. So, you know, we're working with that and recognizing that, okay, when, when I'm clinging to a particular sense, my uh, desire to see, to, to, uh, to uh, touch something or taste something, etc., you know, we see where that, how that affects our own experience. So it's seeing through that again, it's seeing how the, the sense bases um, create this delusion of self. Uh, so that's, uh, then we move on to the seven factors of enlightenment. So again, this is something we observe as we're sitting. And it may be only observed momentarily. So the seven factors of enlightenment are mindfulness, joy, investigation. So we've talked about investigation and mindfulness. Energy, tranquility, concentration, and activity. Seven factors of enlightenment. Um, and the last is the Four Noble Truths. So, in this fourth foundation, um, He's basically laid out the entire path of liberation. So, the fourth foundation. The fourth foundation. So the fourth foundation is mindfulness of these things, the five energies, yeah. the five angles. It's really it's, what it's really doing is allowing. I mean, he, you know, the Buddha was such an amazing teacher because he, he just made it so simple. He created these categories. Mm-hmm. It's like so an experience arises, we feel a certain way, and we see then where that fits into these experiences Mm -hmm. and how that relates to our own liberation. So when, uh, and and it's, and and the the foundations aren't progressive. It's not like, oh, I'll sit for five minutes in the foundation of the body and then I'm going to move to foundations. I mean, it can be, but it doesn't really work that way. So, so we're sitting with foundation of the body. We notice um, we notice a physical sensation arising that we don't like. So we notice ill will. We notice unpleasant. So that's the Vedana. The ill will is the, the, the thought, and it's also the hindrance. Uh, and then we notice that as we attend to it and actually sit with it and Investigated, so this investigation that equanimity arises, that our ability to just be equanimous within that feeling, within that unpleasantness, within that difficult sensation, we can be equanimous. And there's another. That's one of the seven factors. So we're at that moment, and it mainly lasts a few seconds. At that moment, we've experienced equanimity, equanimity, um, and we've experienced the the third noble truth, we've experienced freedom from craving. So we're just, you know, it's just laying out um, a way of clarifying our experience in this, in this fourth foundation. And the way it's practiced, um, in a sense, is through the practice of choiceless awareness. So we've, you know, what we've experimented with so far, what we've experienced so far, is simply being with the body, and our primary object is, is, for instance, the breath. With choiceless awareness, what's really happening is we start with the uh, awareness of the breath or the body, or we choose. And then when another sensation 
becomes much more prevalent. Rather than recognizing it immediately coming back to our primary object, that experience becomes the object of awareness. And we investigate. So investigation happens. Investigation into how we're clinging to it, how we're pushing it away. Investigation as to its impermanence. Um, investigation into its, basically, its unsatisfactoriness. And investigation into its, the fact that it has no inherent self, there's no inherent identity to whatever the sensation is. We tend to identify with it, and identify it, and, and as a result, have some. And from that, you know, an equ equanimity can arise. And the third level truth can be experienced momentarily. So, as I said, I mean, these moments are are fleeting at times, but it's the recognition of the fleetingness, it's, it's the recognition of the moment, regardless of how fleeting it is, that allows us to say, ah, yeah, okay, there is that third moment. There is, that we do have these moments of freedom. We need to recognize them for what they are, and then cultivate a path that allows us to experience them more often. That path is the Eightfold Path, which is the Fourth Noble Truth, which is at the very end of the Fourth Foundation of Mindfulness. So it's all very uh, integrated. And um, it's the beauty of these teachings that, as any great teaching, as you know, as any great teaching, it doesn't matter how many times you been through it, heard it, that it's a continual deepening of you. So that uh, with, the, with the Four Noble Truths, basically what's happening is that we, in each truth, we have the conceptual understanding of that truth, or the conceptual understanding of suffering. We have the experience of it know what the experience of our own suffering is. And then we have the knowing that we know it, basically the embodying of it. So that um, it's not, there's no, there's no thought process, it's like, ah, yeah, this is this, this is this. That, that embodiment, in my experience, comes from the practice of the four foundations. So the, the, the real investigation leads to, uh, that this is it. This is the experience. So that it's, uh, at every moment of experience, and not just in formal practice, but in every moment of our, our existence, we start to really see what's happening clearly. Um, and we do this with compassionate heart. Compassion plays a major role here. And the compassion arises spontaneously when we, three, when we can see through the delusion of self. So that um, when we notice, for instance, when we have true moments of compassion, for others at least, that there's no thought at all. Right? There's no identity at all. The compassion just arises. There's no omission about it. Exactly. When it comes to our own compassion, compassion to ourselves, there's a lot of conditionality, if it arises at all. So we're, but when we start to see through that delusion of self, then the compassion arises spontaneously toward ourselves as well, toward this body mind conflict. So that uh, the investigation is continual, the experience of, ah, okay, so this is, this is clinging, this is craving, this is uh, craving for non-existence of this experience. It's okay, you know, this, that's, that's being human, you know, seeing through that, being okay with that, and moving on. Um, and, you know, we all would, of course, we experience it only when the opposite is there, we can experience that very clearly. Right. So, most people think that the opposite is the default. So, oh, it's always like this. You know, I always thought, this is just the way I am. This is just the way it is. That's the default. 
But as we start to actually pay attention, we realize that that default is completely unnecessary. And in fact, the real default is this. Yeah, so it's going from this to this. Um, and, you know, we set up obstacles that get in our way. And in a sense, the Eightfold Path, the fourth of the Four Noble Truths, um, is a path to, to start getting rid of the obstructions. So, um, the Eightfold Path incorporates much of what we've already talked about. It incorporates right and wise view, which has to do with the illusion itself. It incorporates um, right intention, wise intention. It, uh, so these are the wisdom parts of the path. There are the mindfulness parts of the path, which include right, right mindfulness, meditation practice, right concentration, and right effort. And then there are the ethical parts of the path. Ethical behavior, which again seem completely obvious to everybody, in terms of right action, right speech, and right livelihood. Um, in this case, this word right is a bit strong, probably, probably not the right word because we always think of right in the context of wrong. What it's really talking about is really right in the context of balance, like the riding of a boat. Mm -hmm. Some people, there's a, one teacher that who likes to speak of wise. Um, there's another teacher that refers to it as perfect, which I also think is problematic. I like to think of it as right becoming wise. So that as we develop our practice, as we develop our wisdom, what, what was right, i.e. right in the terms that we have to volitionally act right, or right, proper place becomes not volitional at all, it just becomes the way we are. In the context, in the Buddhist context, what he's referring to is right in the sense that our actions are coming from a place of generos generosity, compassion, and wisdom, as opposed to greed, hatred, and delusion. So we just start to observe this more, with more clarity, you know. So are my actions coming from generosity always? Or is there a little bit of greed there? Like, even if we're generous, it, is there some greed in that generosity? It's like, do I want do I want credit for that generosity? Mm -hmm. Where's that from? Right. And, and again, we have to do it from a place of compassion. I mean, not like, oh, that's bad for me to want credit for my generosity. It's just noticing. It's just saying, oh, that's interesting. I seem to, you know, when I give, when I leave that dollar in the, by the cash register, you know, for the person that's serving me, do I want that person to see me? Do I want to wait until the person's watching to get the dollar? Or not? You know, that's, you know, so it's just an interesting thing to observe. It's like that there's generosity, but there's also a certain level of greed there. Mm -hmm. So it's just attending to that. So as we, you know, work, Again, the Eightfold Path is a, it's, it's an ongoing and uh, it keeps feeding back on itself. And so we have the ethical part of that path, how to do with right speech, right livelihood, and right actions. We know that if we act from a place of, of ill will and act from a place of greed and act from a place of delusion, that this is going to affect our mindfulness, right? it's very difficult to be mindful and concentrated when you've done some act that's caused harm. Right? But we can see that, and we start to reflect back on that, and realize, okay, that caused this, which has caused that. And if we can do that from a place of compassion, then that sort of allows us to relax around it, constrict less around it, recognizing that, okay, the next time that won't be the case. And then we can move through that. But we, we really attend to it, um, so that it's all coming from within, and not, it's not a commandment, it's coming from within, from our own experience. 
beautiful thing also about the, the way the Buddha taught, he said, you know, hey, don't take my word for it, do it yourself. Right. So it's all experiential. Yeah. Um, that that points to a discussion we were having the other day, in which you just said about the commandment versus yeah. the internal, and what you said earlier about the five hindrances, um, and how the list that's thrown around in Roman Christianity today, the seven deadly sins. Mm. Right. These are things that you do then, and if you do them, you have to go to confession, pay for your, pay for your penalty, right. or else you're in deep, you're in deep trouble. In this year. The origin of that list is a list that's very much like the five hindrances, and it started with this guy named Evagrius Pontius, and the original intent of the list is these are the things that are going to keep you, going to trip you up during your practice, and it was eight. One of the popes saw the list, said, hey, we can use this, right. combine two, made seven, now to be a management tool instead of a practice. Yeah. And they were just, that when you were talking about the five hindrances, I said, that's exactly what yeah. Evagoras was talking about with the original list. Mm. And it, it had the sense of, you can't sit down and do your practice if you're consumed by lust. Right. And that becomes the commandment. You cannot be lustful or you're in trouble, Mr. You know. Interesting, yeah. And they're not actually um, the precepts. So the, when it comes to right action, uh, it refers back to what's called the five precepts, the five lay precepts. There are also monastic precepts, which there are hundreds. Um, but the, they're, they're called training precepts. So the precepts, uh, the five training precepts are refrain from harm. But each of these is balanced out, so refrain from harm by cultivating love. Right? Refrain from taking what is not given by cultivating generosity. Refrain from sexual misconduct conduct by cultivating contentment. Refrain from lying by cultivating honesty. Refrain from intoxicants. So in, in, intoxicants can be a pretty broad category. By refraining by cultivating awareness. Awareness of you know how the intoxicant may impact. Um, and then the, the Buddha also had a wonderful, there's a wonderful sutta where he's speaking to his son, Rahula. You may know in the, in the Buddha's story that uh, right before he left for his, right before he left the palace uh, to go off on his search, shortly before that he had a son. Mm. Um, and then he left in the middle of the night. A number of years later, he comes back, and the son basically joins the uh, sangha. <clears throat> anyway, he's uh, he, he's talking to Rahula, and, and he says, Rahula, you know, before you take an action, notice that that action is going to cause harm, in you or the other, right? And if you miss that while you're taking the action, attend to whether it's going to cause harm to you or the other. But if you miss that, reflect back on the action and notice whether it caused harm to you or the other. So it's like, this is about attention, obviously, you know, coming from a wholesome intention and wholesome, again, being arising from generosity, arising from compassion, arising from wisdom, or unwholesome. So, you know, you're just looking at it all the way around, along. And what I love about that teaching is that uh, it gives the guy a break, right? You know, so you, 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 obviously the ideal is to, to look at this before, to be fully aware and mindful before any action is taken. You miss that, at least you know, while you're in the midst of it, you know, reflecting on this. And if you miss that, okay, you know, then afterwards recognize what's happening. So it's this beautiful, you know, the kid was probably seven or eight when he taught him this, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, there's just something very special about that teaching to me, because it, it A, it reflects on the compassion that the Buddha had for his son, you know, but also the compassion that the Buddha had recognizing that we're all human, and that we do this occasionally. And as long as we can be aware of the fact that we've missed, which brings up, of course, the whole teaching of karma, which we don't have time to get into right now. And the teaching of sin. 
Well, yeah. Just amartya, as mentioned in yeah. Mark. Yeah, so the word sin doesn't really arise in Buddhism. No, there's it's not. in Mark, is yeah. what it actually means in yeah. Greek. Exactly. Um, so it's, uh, and it's recognizing that, you know, your actions have consequences in this life or the next. Uh, or in the next life, but the next life could be the next moment. So, um, you know, this is, this is, you know, all part of right action and right speech. Um, so that as we, you know, work on, as we follow the Eightfold Path, we're constantly working on all of these aspects. So, you know, we, we recognize when, so the first of the Eightfold Path is, is right view. And the right view is what we've been talking about all along in terms of the view of what's causing our suffering, what's causing our craving. Or, you know, the craving is the cause of suffering. Um, the delusion of self, you know, as we really start to um, embody right view and become wise view, you know, then that has an impact on all of our other actions. Um, and then we, you know, ref- we keep reflecting back, we keep reflecting back. Yeah. So, uh, I've talked an awful lot. Um, I mean, maybe we should just do, if there are any questions that come up, that haven't come up already, it might be worth just looking at that, and then we can sit for a bit. Yeah, I do have a quick today. question. Um, the, uh, I think most people in the West, when they think about Buddhism, they think about monasticism, you know, monastic Buddhism. Um, but you've mentioned a number of times about formal practice versus sure. kind of your everyday life. It is, how, how do you approach that as, as somebody who is obviously not a, a monastic? Yeah, well, I mean, even in, even in a monastic situation, they're not always meditating, that's true. You know, they, they, uh, <clears throat> and I think, you know, more and more, of course, in this country at least, um, while there are some monasteries, uh, most people go on retreats, you know, to retreat centers that are uh, by no means monastic, unless, unless that particular retreat happens to be led by a monastic. But to come back to the question of formal versus informal, um, so there was this Trungpa Rinpoche, who I've quoted from before, uh, many years ago, uh, when he was alive, he died 15 years ago or so, but he appeared on, I think, the David Letterman show. And Letterman said something like, so when you're meditating, are you in a trance? And Rinpoche's answer was, no, 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 we're always in a trance. You know, when you're meditating, you're actually yeah, with your experience. Yeah. And so, in terms of bringing this to formal, you know, in, to life, it's just recognizing that every moment is a moment of mindfulness, it has the potential to be a moment of mindfulness, and recognizing again when we're not there and when we are there. So, um, you know, we teach the walking meditation. Which we didn't do here because it wouldn't look very good on camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, in walking meditation, in formal walking meditation, you're attending to uh, the body. You're attending to all the sensations of walking. You're attending, you're noticing when the mind is off somewhere else, and you come back to the sensations of walking. So you can take walking meditation and out onto the streets right now, and obviously you're not going to, you, know, you have to be present to what's happening, but you notice how often your mind is off somewhere yeah. You know, and, and then you come back to what's actually the experience in that moment. Um, and so it's that continual practice. And not giving yourself a hard time when your mind goes off, because that's what our mind does, just noticing. I'm noticing how often when you're in conversation with somebody, you're not actually listening, because you're thinking about what you're going to say, or you're daydreaming depending on the situation, you know, but you're not really listening. So that's that's really what we're talking about. 
And then, of course, noticing how often, and this is where we're coming back to meditation versus liberation, how often you know, our suffering in whatever context, whether it's within a professional context or in a domestic context, the suffering comes from holding on to this delusion of self and, and creating this this wall between self and other, you know, which which keeps compassion from arising, which um, is the cause of craving and pain, because we're holding on to that those aggregates as this is me, this is who I am, I can't be another way. Um, and recognizing, oh, okay, when I, when I see through that, then things shift. And not only does my behavior change, but the other person's behavior changes. Um, it has to. So it's just it's starting to observe that and be a parent to that. The same thing happens in a monastery. You know, spend a little time in monasteries, you know, you see it all the time. The monks have them goes too. <laughs> and it's interesting to watch, you know, uh, how how the, the senior monastic, you know, the, the abbot of the monastery, who's in this case has you know, been a monk since he was 14, was, you know, how, how he is able to kind of flow with this continual self and it's going on with the, monastic, the other monastics, you know, or not. So it's, as we say, selfing is optional, right? So we have a choice when we want to, like, be tied to that and when we don't. And, you know, we start to eventually see, uh, you know, I think I'd rather live on this side of that than this. But obviously at times you have to. There's uh, another one of my favorite quotes here. Um, yeah, this is from T.S. Eliot. It says, we die to each other daily. What we know of other people is only our memory of the moments during which we knew them. And they have changed since then. To pretend that we, they and we are the same is a useful and convenient social convention, which must sometimes be broken. We must also remember that at every meeting we are meeting a stranger. So, you know, we have these convenient social conventions that of course we need, and most of us are stuck in those social conventions. But once we see through that, then things really start to flow in a different way. That, that life is not fixed, but it's a process. Um, yeah. But thanks for that question, because it's important. I mean, you know, that... Um, well, it's just important that, you know, we don't teach... You don't learn to meditate to become a better meditator. Mm -hmm. Meditation is just a tool to allow us to see what's really happening and how we bring that to life is what's important to the rest of our lives. Or essentially, all of our life is meditation. We have to label it. 